kappa. Okay, so very thin, very thin systems. Uh, it turns out you'll see are uh, going to just be related to low bending rigidity. So let's look at this. We can rewrite a two-dimensional Young's modulus in terms of 3D modulus times just an energy per unit volume. So to get an energy per unit area, we have to multiply by the only scale that we have left, which is a thickness. And the bending rigidity is an, is, uh, an energy. So we have to multiply by, by something with dimensions length cubed. So that's the thickness cubed. So now if you put this back into the von Kármán number, you see that the bulk modulus cancels out and you end up, and one T cancels out. So you end up with L over T squared. So this number is controlled by pure geometry. Okay? So uh, a high value of this number corresponds to a turbulent kind of system, low viscosity system, and a high number corresponds to a high Reynolds number system or damped kind of system. So this is what we're going to explore. And automatically you see very thin systems are gonna have high von Kármán number purely in terms of geometry. Okay. Now, very, very low bending rigidity corresponds to high temperature. We expect this system to crumple in some way, but first we're going to explore the regime uh, below the crumpling transition temperature and then think about crumpling. Now, uh, let's look at thermal fluctuations on the system. The bending rigidity of graphene, of course, it's controlled by atomic physics. So it's electron volt scale. It's in fact around 1.2 electron volts. And let's imagine doing a room temperature experiment. So this is 50 kBT. Room temperature, I remember from qualifying exams and so on, is a 40th of an electron volt. So this is 50 kBT. So if you're trained in any kinds of thermodynamics, statistical mechanics, you would say, well, okay, this is absolutely negligible. It's not going to have any kind of thermal effect as the Boltzmann factor is of order e to the minus 50. So shouldn't it be irrelevant? And the answer is no. This is a system where the entropy is essential. It can adopt all kinds of these rough topography configurations. And those can compensate, density of states if you want, can compensate this exponentially small Boltzmann factor. So this is associated with all the shapes the system can assume. It's associated with the escape into the third dimension, which you can think of also as another kind of phonon. So besides the two dimensional phonons, you have this third degree of freedom, which is going to cost you strain energy and it's going to appear both in the bending energy and in the stretching energy. So they are nominally coupled. Are there any questions? Okay, let's go. On. So let's look now at graphene parameters. By the way, this kind of uh, very large uh, entropically dominated behavior of the system is a feature of soft systems, but graphene is also- Sorry, I had a question. I had yes. a question. Yeah, yes. uh, uh, can you uh, uh, explain once again why uh, this kappa is uh, atomic energy, which is one EV roughly? Uh, I mean, it's not bending on an atomic scale, right? I mean, if the bending rigidity kappa that you wrote down, uh, the bending will happen at a longer length scale. Uh, so this is the microscopic bending rigidity. So it is happening on the microscopic scale. It's bending actual atomic bonds, carbon-carbon bonds. But we are going to explore exactly what you say, the, what the bending energy for a macroscopic membrane of some size L. Yes, so that is going to be absolutely crucial for what we do here. So this kappa is the short distance bending rigidity. You can think of it like a bare bending rigidity in field theory. Does that answer the question? Uh, okay, all right, yeah. Yeah, so we're going to exactly explore this behavior of the system as a function of this bending rigidity as a function of the length scale. That is going to be crucial. So uh, let's look at this von Kármán number for uh, graphene. Let's look at graphene parameters. So the 
Young's modulus of graphene is quite high. It's 20 electron volts per angstrom squared, yeah, or 2.2 times 10 to the nine electron volts per micron squared. And so the von Kármán number, if you put it in there, is about 10 to the nine times the area in microns squared. So if you take a 100 micron ribbon of the system, you get a von Kármán number of 10 to the 13. Now notice that if I just do the analysis that we described before, the dimensional argument, the L over T squared, that gives me a comparable number of order 10 to the 12. So we're talking about very, very rough kinds of systems. That's what gives it the interesting topography. Even L equals 10 microns gives you one common number of order 10 to the nine. By contrast, uh, standard A4 paper has uh, one common number of order 10 to the seven. So paper can actually give you a, some intuition about the behavior of the system, except that you have to think about thermalized paper, not zero temperature paper. So we will, we will come to that. So what happens is exactly the question that was asked before. What happens when you heat up this graphene sheet? Well, it's the, by virtue of the roughness of the system, it's going to be thicker. And so you can think of the RMS height of the surface like a thermal kinds of thermal kind of thickness. So when the when the uh, thickness increases by a, a factor of two, then this von Kármán number is going to uh, change by a factor of four, go down by a factor of four. If you drop the thickness by a factor of two, it's going to go up by a factor of four. So this means that it's effectively becoming stiffer. Thick, increasing thickness by thermal fluctuations means that it's stiffer. So it's going to be less bendable as a sheet. Now, the question that was asked before is what about the size dependence of this? Uh, you can imagine these thermal uh, fluctuations, these roughness, uh, like corrugations in cardboard, which make it quite a bit stiffer to bending against the corrugations. But for a thermal system, you have isotropic correlation, corrugations all throughout the system. So however you try to bend it, you're bending against these thermal corrugations. So the bending rigidity is going to grow with the system size, and that is what we're going to explore. You can get some uh, intuition of this. I had a question. Uh, yes, please. What is corrugation? Corrugation is just, uh, you know, if you take cardboard and you bend it like this up, down, up, down, and uh, it's hard to bend against the corrugation. Just a bunch of ridges like that. Understood. Okay. So if I take uh, an ordinary piece of paper, it's very, very hard to shear. It's very strong, like, uh, like graphene, but it's so flimsy that it can't even support uh, its own weight. It bends over under gravity. Oh, it's hard to see here. Now, a typical kind of thermalized configuration, you can imagine that you crumple it up and open it up to get one of these roughened surfaces. And now you see it can support its own weight. It's quite stiff. And this is a caricature, but this is borne out by um, analytic calculations of the growth of the bending rigidity with uh, temperature and with system size. By the way, it's also easier now to stretch and we'll also explore how the elastic moduli change with uh, length scales. So how does this all come about? Um, the stretching energy is some modulus, as I said before, times the strain tensor squared. Strain tensors are derivatives of displacements or phonons, but when you have fluctuations into the third dimension, there's a new contribution to the strain tensor, which looks like a derivative of H times the derivative of H, the height fluctuations. 
The strain tensor has three degrees of freedom. It's a two by two symmetric matrix. And so there's no way that you can make this zero just by allowing it to elastically relax via phonons, which only have two degrees of freedom. So this means whenever you have height fluctuations due to bending, you have also some stretching energy. And that will appear as this term here squared. So it's nonlinear in the height fluctuations. And if you integrate out the phonons in the system, you get a kind of nonlinear stretching term. And that's going to contribute to a growth in the bending rigidity, as we sort of saw in that cartoon with paper. So how does this work? Um, you can actually calculate the bending rigidity as a function of system size in a kind of low temperature expansion. The nonlinear stretching term comes out proportional to the Young's modulus times temperature divided by the microscopic bending rigidity. So we have the microscopic bending rigidity plus this term in front. And then we have a fluctuation term. This term represents the nonlinear stiffness we get when we, nonlinear stretching we get when we integrate out phonons. So I'm just showing the schematics of this calculation. I won't go into all the details here. But this term here, you can see dimensionally, naive power counting tells you that it grows as L squared, as an area term. Now you can compute this term, it's better computed of course in Fourier space. And because we had uh, a Laplacian squared in the stretching energy, it's the inverse of that gives you Q to the fourth like term. And then we can put in the bottom here for self-consistency, a renormalized bending rigidity. So if you do power counting of this kind of system, then you'll see you have, and we allow so the bending rigidity to run with scale, not to be a number, but to be a scale dependent quantity. Then we have D squared K over K to the fourth, that gives one over uh, Q squared. And then we can have a contribution from this renormalized bending rigidity. So let's supposing that grows like Q to the minus eta, some exponent. Then this whole thing grows as length to the two minus eta. So for eta less than two, which it will be, has to be between zero and one. Um, this is a, a, an IR or a long length scale divergent quantity. And in fact, let's look at this a little bit more carefully to see why the bending rigidity must run with length scale. So let's just put this back in here and ask, on the left, you have a renormalized bending rigidity and on the right, you have this integral here. Let's supposing we take the bending rigidity to be a constant. So we have constant on the left, scale independent thing, and we have something on the right that goes like one over Q squared or L squared. So they cannot match. So there's no self-consistent solution for constant bending rigidity. And in fact, you can see that if you take kappa to go like one over Q, then you get uh, one over Q on the right-hand side as well. So that's exactly a kind of self-consistent solution, which was shown by Nelson and Politi way back in the eighties. Uh, may I ask a question? Yes. Yeah, this integral on the right hand side, you have integral over Q, right? Yes. And then why is it a function of Q again on the left hand side? Oh, it's, it's, it's a function of, so the proper integral is down here. So there's a, it's integral over K uh, oh, okay. is more exact. And there's, and, and there's an extra momentum Q coming in. Uh, okay. So K okay. is the, the momentum in the loop and there's an external Q. Yeah. Ah, okay, so that's yeah. not the integral of our Q in that way, second integral you have written. Right, so right, right. Yes, okay. this is the okay. proper expression uh, here. So just being schematic over here. Okay. Yeah, yeah, sorry. Correct, that's correct. Yeah, Q is really, this is really um, integral over K and then Q is an external momentum. Yeah. Thank you. So, um, so we see that the bending rigidity in terms of length scales, one over Q is a length scale L. 
So not only is it scale dependent, but it's very, very strongly scale dependent. We make the system a hundred times larger than the bending rigidity, effective bending rigidity for that sheet is a hundred times the bare bending rigidity, which was exactly the earlier question. Is that uh, clear on the earlier question? Yeah, thank you very yeah. much. Okay, great. So this is the beauty of the system, and this is what we wanted to explore uh, in, in this work. Um, you can take one material, one beautiful, pure, pristine material with great properties, and you can design it, you can obtain any kind of material uh, property you want, for example, the bending, just by making it of the right size. So this is geometric control over the properties of the system. You have an infinite number of elastic moduli and bending moduli controlled by the geometry and the one common number controlled by the geometry as well. So this kind of geometric control is not something that's very familiar to uh, experimentalists to work on, you know, microelectromechanical systems, nanoelectromechanical systems, but they are beginning to explore this and it's, uh, it can be quite powerful. More generally, um, the, if you do the same kind of analysis for the elastic moduli, the Young's modulus, it can have scale dependence as well. And these numbers have been uh, calculated in various kinds of uh, analytic ways and measured numerically. And ATA, the running of the bending rigidity drops a little bit from one and the Young's modulus actually has a positive exponent, A to U, so it gets softer for larger length scales, which you saw again also for the paper, once it's crumpled up, you can stretch it a little bit. These two numbers are Bayes scaling relation, which is the result of rotational invariance. So two A to plus A to U must be two. So it's a very weird kind of system because the elastic moduli at infinite length scales goes to zero. So it would be very, very floppy, but it has a well-defined limit. And the Poisson ratio in this limit is quite unusual. The uh, bulk modulus is smaller than the shear modulus. And this gives a Poisson ratio of minus one third. So when you pull on it, you iron out all these entropic corrugations, these fluctuations, and they spill out in the transverse direction. And that gives it the negative Poisson ratio. So um, as the length scales get bigger, the bending rigidity grows and that flattens out the system. Actually, you know that if, you if the system were a ferromagnet, then it would have no low temperature ordered phase. This is so-called uh, Merman wagner homburg theorem, that there's no, you know, you have to go above two dimensions in order to get spontaneous symmetry breaking. Well, because of this anomalous behavior of the couplings or bending rigidity in this case in the system, that is not true in the system. It can have a two dimensional ordered phase and that's due to the growth of the bending rigidity. It's, called flat, but of course it's this roughened kind of object with a non-trivial roughness exponent, which you also can calculate from those other exponents. So in fact, it has a rather remarkable ordered low temperature phase. And the phase diagram looks, you know, it's gonna be something like this. So here's the, if you look at the normals to the system, they look something like spins, but they're actually constrained spins because they have to be normal to an underlying surface. And exactly those constraints, which lead to these non-trivial uh, scaling exponents or anomalous dimensions and mean that it's different from a ferromagnet. And it's those constraints, those fewer degrees of freedom compared to a ferromagnet that allow it to order. Um, the symmetry is quite different from a ferromagnet because of the, the normals are in the normal bundle geometrically. Sufficiently high temperature, you should have an analog of the turbulent phase, as I said, uh, and that should be a crumpled object like this over here where the normal normal correlation functions uh, just go to zero as a function at, at long distances. And we will explore how you could uh, see this kind of crumpled phase as well in a minute. 
Now, um, this kind of behavior, as I said, is, was well known. It was beautifully explored. Uh, Nelson Politi by the French group David Guitier um, and so on in the 80s and 90s. And we always thought if we wanted to see this kind of behavior and in particular crumpling and so on, I always thought that we would want that we would explore soft kinds of systems because those are exactly the ones that can fluctuate a lot and bend a lot and so on. Well, let's look at that a little bit more carefully. So let's write that uh, running of the bending rigidity or its scale dependence in terms of lengths. And so we had the term YKBT over kappa on the right, and then something of dimensions length squared. So let's ask when the contributions due to thermal fluctuations are comparable to the bare bending rigidity. That means that uh, these two terms, this is sort of when, you know, when the fluctuations are comparable to the zeroth order result. So it's when it's sort of, in a sense, um, starts to go non-perturbative when fluctuations are important. So let's call that length scale L thermal. So if you just balance these two terms, then you find L thermal goes like the bare bending rigidity just divided by the square root of Y KBT. So if we put in graphene numbers, Y was 20 electron volts per angstrom squared, room temperature is 1 40th. This comes out of order one or two angstroms. So it's exactly the large, the, the strength of graphene, the high Young's modulus and the relatively low bending rigidity, relatively speaking, that means that thermal fluctuations set in already at microscopic length scales. Soft systems also have low bending rigidity. They can have very low bending rigidity, but they have low Young's modulus as well. So this L thermal can be big. And that's why this very nice combination of soft and hard systems turns out to be the perfect place to see the statistical mechanics of a thermally fluctuating membrane. Let's just look at a couple of systems. So people explored a lot the red blood cell cytoskeleton. Uh, in fact, um, Abe Struck, who was a graduate student at Harvard with uh, George Whiteside, spent a whole thesis trying to make a spectrum cytoskeleton thermalized elastic membrane. And it's a very, very fragile kind of structure. So it's difficult. And as good as he is, he actually failed to do that, but went on to very successful career. If you compute L thermal for that system, it's about a 10 microns and the system itself is microns. So you cannot build it. You cannot, you don't have enough length scale to see the thermal fluctuations. They're only just beginning to set in. And if you do it for a paper, then the thermal length scale is about a 50 kilometers. So you have to have, um, Yes. What about uh, synthetic vesicles, giant unilaminar vesicles and systems like that? Yeah, if you can make those big enough, um, they have to be, the, the difficulty there also is to keep them, uh, the bending rigidity low enough and make them still structurally rigid so that they don't fall apart. But that would be a way to go to, people look at uh, cross-linked polymers and so on. Um, David Bensimon tried to make DNA membranes. And the problem there is a DNA cross-linking chemistry is tricky. But I think people could probably do that now. It's a very good question. And, uh, you mentioned this, uh, this effect of the Poisson ratio. So I suppose you get negative Poisson ratio because of, uh, uh, you get this oxidic kind of behavior, I suppose, right? Because when you stretch uh, in one direction, then you're also stretching in the perpendicular direction. So, um, yes, it's an oxetic behavior, which is just um, neologism for a negative Poisson ratio. But it's, you know, oxetic materials have been designed based on the cell geometry. So if you have a kind of a, a re-entrant cell geometry, then what you say is true. If you 
pull on it in one direction and it has to open up in the transverse direction. But the reason that it happens here for a thermalized membrane is quite different. When you stretch it, then the, you're sort of squashing the entropic fluctuations, the roughness of the system. And that, had, that spills out in the transverse direction. So you are not exactly stretching it there, but it, the system will uh, expand in that direction because it's being squashed in the other direction, if you like. So it's an entropically generated um, oxetic behavior, which I think is um, beautiful. It's quite a different mechanism. You don't have to change the local cell geometry in any way. You just have to have the fluctuations. Does that answer thank the you. question? Yeah, yeah thank you. Good. Very good question, yeah. Nobody has really exploited this mechanism for making oxetic materials yet. It's another challenge. So um, Melina Bliss, who did her thesis in Paul McEwan's group at Cornell, explored this kind of um, behavior by actually releasing graphene sheets in water. And you can see here a, micro mic a tip micro manipulator that's pushing on the, going to push on graphene. That's the darker looking structure. And it folds up, you see it's, uh, it folds a little bit, it develops some corrugation, and then you re release it and it stays intact. It's quite strong, but it changes shape. And you can do this back and forth, back and forth many, many times. By the way, the electronic properties hardly change because the electrons in pi bonds will flow over these curved surfaces. So um, that's another interesting feature of these systems. You can see a 10 micron scale bar there on the right. They can make um, many, many, many of these systems. Uh, there, it's shown here a whole bunch of them with gold pads on the left and right to sort of clamp them. And if you look, it's pretty hard to see, but actually some of these are whole uh, ribbons. And then um, further up, you can have many uh, ribbons, many, stretching between these pads made simultaneously. I think you can see it better in the next. Yeah, you can see it better in this picture here. The top one is one ribbon and you're pushing it back and forth with a micro manipulator. And you can do this thousands of times and it doesn't break. And uh, below it, um, we're getting here, there are two ribbons below that and there are four or five ribbons below that and so on. So you can make a whole bunch of different widths at once and control uh, the geometry like that and explore this geometric dependence in the system. They actually measured the bending rigidity at room temperature for these systems. So the way you do it is you can just uh, do it by like a diving board, put a, a mass on the end and measure the spring constant and back out the bending rigidity or more cleverly to get rid of gravity, you turn it on its side and bombard it with a laser. And from, uh, from fluctuation dissipation theorem, from the fluctuations, you can back out the stiffness. And what they find is that the stiffness is about uh, 70, is about 7,000 times the microscopic value, about 7,000 electron volts. It's shown on the right here bottom is length scale. So if you go up to 10 microns, you get a bending rigidity. That's of order, this is Newton's per meter. It's sort of four, four orders of magnitude bigger than this microscopic electron volt bending rigidity. Again, uh, addressing the, the earlier question. So they actually verified this bending rigidity growth. Although there are some questions about the effect of static ripples from fabrication in these uh, systems. Now, uh, what about the crumpling transition? Again, this was something people thought they would be able to see in soft systems, but you might say this looks like the perfect system to, to see this. So let's see if we can generate it. So there's a low temperature flat phase on the right, crumpling transition, which is believed to be continuous and a high temperature 
crumpled face shown on the left there. Now let's put in some numbers so you can compute this normal normal correlation function for graphene and you can show that it goes to zero that would be the crumpling transition temperature at a value which is basically two pi times this exponent eta I told you is of order one times the bare bending rigidity. So that comes out to be order six electron volts. Well, for room temperature experiment, that, so that six electron volts corresponds to 70,000 Kelvin. So too bad your graphene is vaporized at that stage. So we looked at ways to get around this, to improve this, to see if we could generate a situation where graphene would crumple at room temperatures. And we tried a few different things. So the first was to actually perforate this graphene. So you puncture it with a bunch of holes. And here is shown a periodic uh, array of holes, except out of this uh, triangular lattice, you cut these hexagons, dense periodic array. And here's a, a movie showing the intact system in blue and the perforated system in red or pink. See, at the same temperature, you see the perforated system is already starting to fold and bend a bit. And if we go to at higher temperature, it's starting to fold up. This is near the crumpling transition to fold up into a basket-like structure. And very high temperature, it, or higher temperature again, it crumples. When the intact membrane is unperforated membrane is still flat. So, it can be made to work. Here's shown all three of these situations at once. Um, KT is 0.4 times kappa, 1.14 and 1.25. You might say, okay, it's going to depend a lot on how you perforate it. So what we found though, is that there's a beautiful scaling of the crumbling transition temperature just in terms of the removed area, it doesn't matter how you remove the area. It only matters um, the fraction of area that's removed. And the effect is very, very strong. The transition temperature drops by the removed area, fraction of area removed squared. So, or roughly squared. So if you um, remove 90% of the material, you get a factor of 100 drop in the transition temperature. And this shows different, uh, different ways of removing holes and collapse onto just the fraction of area removed. So this gives you a feasible way of um, crumpling graphene and you can easily perforate it you know, with, my, with lithography in the manufacture. There's actually a better way we found of doing it. Uh, can I ask a question? Yes, please. Yeah, so uh, regarding the last slide, so removing, uh, uh, like making these holes and uh, see this beautiful scaling. So uh, 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 you are putting the holes in a, on a triangular lattice, but if, you, if the whole arrangement is random, do you see the similar scaling or you need to have this lattice? That is an excellent question. Um, that's an excellent question. A random array of holes will be different. Uh, and what we believe, but we have improved it, is that a random array of holes, sorry, it's a lot of, uh, it will be crumple when the system perforates, when the percolates, when the holes percolate. So I believe random distribution of holes will be different. And okay. So, yeah. So that's that is a, that hasn't been calculated, but I think it can be done relating it to percolation of holes. When they okay. cross them. Yeah. Very good problem. Thank you. The even better way of doing this is to consider what we call a frame. So you cut out, you know, you take a square, um, take a square and cut out a window. And so you get a thin frame shown here. And that has all kinds of interesting bending configurations. It's like a ring polymer, but the, it's not a 
you know, tubular kind of polymer. It's these ribbons. And you can calculate when such a thing crumples. And for example, if the width, the thin width is 100 nanometers and the length on the side is 50 microns, it should crumple. And these are feature sizes that you can make in lithography. So we've posed this as a challenge to the experimentalists and they haven't yet met this challenge, but they, it's feasible to do it. And actually the way it crumples is very, very interesting. So what happens is it actually sequentially um, folds in half. And if you take a membrane and just fold along a line rather than folding an area, then you know, the, the, in the large system size limit, it costs basically no energy to fold along a line. It goes down by one over a length squared compared to folding a bulk uh, a membrane. So that's a very low energy mode of the system. And you can see on the right, what happens is you heat it up. You'll see these sharp creases, fold lines, and then it folds again and again and again until it crumples. So there's actually a whole sequence of precursor folds, origami like folds that lead to the crumpling. Here's shown uh, the folds on the right there in a little bit more detail. And you can actually plot out the fold lines again, just like it was origami, you color when you fold it system over on itself. There's shown of these yellow lines. And then as you increase the temperature, you get more and more. Mark, I have a question. Yes. Do you get Mobius strip like solution for these rings? Uh, no, there's actually no change here in the topology. So you, it doesn't cut and rejoin. So you don't okay. get Mobius strips. You could though, if you made it from DNA and allowed enzymes to cut it and then you allow it to rejoin, you could get that, which would be interesting, but not here. It still has the topology of uh, a strip, like of a, of, a, of a ring of an annulus. Yeah. It doesn't, it's still strong enough that it, it maintains its integrity. Topology here, once you fix the topology here as a frame, doesn't change. And then on the left, you see here the crumpled phase is basically a disordered gas of these fold lines. So you could try to set up the statistical mechanics of folds and look at um, the unbinding of these fold lines as a, describing this crumpling transition that has not been done either. Um, you can, so what happens in these kinds of systems, these frames um, is that it's very, very easy. If you look at the force displacement uh, curves for these systems, very soon when you, when you pull on it, very soon it will bend with conical like disclinations, uh, we call them partial disclinations, at the corners here. So you get all these kinds of configurations shown in blue here, very, very soon. And what's happening is you're trading a Young's modulus stretching for bending. And bending again, uh, to get the right dimensions, this is the bending rigidity has to be divided by the length scale squared. So you trade a large Young's modulus for a low bending rigidity and you gain also by a length squared. So this becomes much, much, much softer to, um, to by, by bending instead of stretching. So we've analyzed this in some detail and in uh, Itai Cohen's lab in Cornell, an experiment was done with paper. So on the upper right is a force displacement curve and you see that there's a very small hookian like behavior. And then very soon when you get these escape into the third dimensions with these partial disclinations at the corners, it flattens out and is a very soft response until you've stretched it enough that you go again, it goes nonlinear. I uh, just wanted to make a comment. Uh, the yes. force extension, curve does remind you of the DNA stretching experiments where there's a 
inextensibility constraint showing up at the end. Like that. There's absolutely. A yes, absolutely. So you can think of this as the graphene analog of single molecule biophysics. Yeah. There you're pulling apart these uh, DNA strands, right? Unzipping. Yeah. Um, and here it's happening because of these the configurations that it can adopt in, uh, in three dimensions. Yeah, but you are pulling apart the sides of the frame as well. So yeah, it's an analogy that uh, David Nelson loves. <laughs> oh, okay. Good, good observation, yeah. Thanks. Um, so ultimately we would like to uh, understand structures that are more complicated like this uh, trampoline, oh, it's hard to see here, but on the, on the right, a very, very, you know, arrays of these kinds of frames and structures. So we basically are solving the small modules of these things, individual frames, individual holes, periodic arrays of holes, um, and then trying to build up a calculus of putting these together. Now, uh, I want to show you a rather surprising uh, result which was discovered by my student Duan Duan Wan, who's now assistant professor at Wuhan University. <laughs> um, and this is the following effect that you, you take one of these graphene uh, sheets or ribbons, you clamp it at one end, as, I, as you saw before, in order to uh, control its behavior in, uh, in, in water and so on, you, you need to hold it at one end rather than having it freely floating. But let's imagine we just clamp it at one end and then we heat it up, okay? And you see that it will spontaneously rises above the horizontal plane. So I could call this a spontaneous tilt. And this is quite uh, remarkable. Here's shown side on view and it fluctuates for a long time above say the horizontal sheet and then it can fluctuate sort of over a barrier or or look to tunnel through the horizontal plane like an ammonia molecule to the inverted uh, tilted phase where it's below the horizontal plane and this happens when the clamping is sufficiently large so um, you can look at the phase diagram for this system and uh, you see at a fixed temperature, red is a uh, high tilt, you get at a fixed temperature, you get the tilt as, as the width of the clamping grows compared to the length. So um, we've developed a, a full theory of this now, but I'll just give you a sort of a cartoon picture of it. The key feature of this is the following, that you have to have the right uh, reference state to analyze uh, the statistical mechanics of this system. So if you take a free membrane like this, then when it's thermalized, because it's got all the topography of the height fluctuations, then it's the projection down onto a horizontal plane is shrunk. So, you know, the area is fixed and it's curved. So it's effectively shrunk when it's thermalized. So now if you clamp on one end, shown on the left here, then with respect to the free thermalized ribbon, you're actually stretching it out. So clamping is like applying an external stress to the system. And that is key for understanding its behavior. So this means that clamping effectively implies a, a stress sigma yy, a y stress in the y direction. And that means that, the, that this stress will also get communicated into the x direction because stretching one direction will cause it to shrink, say, in the other direction. And so it gets communicated to the rest of the membrane. Now, remember, if you look at the strain tensor, it has not only derivatives of the displacements, but it has this term DIH, DJH. So if I look at U, if I look at UXX being non-zero due to, oh, by the way, the, the strain, the, the stresses, 
sigma yy, they couple to strains uyy and so on. And ux, uh, sigma xx couples to uxx. So if this uxx is negative from uyy being positive and sigma yy being positive from the clamping, then you see if you put it into the stretching term, you have a negative dx ux and couples to dhx squared. So consider this derivative of h as a field phi. Oops, and it's a little bit uh, it's cut out, but I should move this. <laughs> um, so what you get out of this is a phi fourth-like theory where phi is the gradient of h. The absolute value of h doesn't matter. It's only gradients of h that matter. And so you get a standard kind of uh, Mexican hat potential for this system with a symmetry breaking generated by the strain. Now, so a non-zero value of the order parameter here, phi, is a non-zero value of the gradient of H. So that means at the origin where the clamping is. So that means it must rise out of the plane and that's spontaneous tilt. So there's a tilt up symmetry broken phase and there's a tilt down symmetry broken phase and at sufficiently high temperatures, you can fluctuate over the barrier and go from up to down. And you can learn about the height of the barrier and so on from the uh, transition rates. So this is a, a two-state oscillator. So at infinitely long time, of course, there's no symmetry breaking, it's equally up or down. But in any given state, which will, la which will live longer and longer and longer as you increase the clamping, then you have a spontaneous breaking of this inversion symmetry with respect to the horizontal. You can do the same kind, we've done the same kind of analysis that a recent paper just came out on the archive for uh, Euler buckling, thermalized Euler buckling. So I remember for Euler buckling, like a ruler, if you impose some kind of stress, then above a threshold, it will buckle up or down. Now the uh, analogous behavior for a thermalized uh, ribbon uh, would be that first of all, again, it's if you have if you have some clamps on the end that you're pushing on, then you have to first push it to the shrunk equilibrium kind of length to have reached the state of no strain because that's where you've released all of this strain from the thermal contractions. And then when you go beyond that, you get thermalized oil of buckling. But the growth in the bending rigidity as a function of temperature means that you have a delay increasing temperature delays the onset of um, Euler buckling compared to zero temperature. So that's a, an effect that you could also uh, measure. It's a little bit more complicated to analyze, but you can analyze even in the presence of an external field, like an electrical gravitational field. And it behaves like a, you know, uh, a magnetic system with an external field. So I would like to, um, yes, was there a question? Yeah, I just, uh, here you show them, hi. Uh, this uh, grad X H squared term. Yeah. I mean, this is a phenomenon, you know, if you want to measure the surface tension of a solid, you just cut a thin slice of it from the top horizontally, mm. and then you see that the cut portion bends. Mm. So okay. does, does your calculation, this kind of, does it have some kind of surface tension in it or something like that or no? Um, you, can, you can view um, this, this term as a, as a kind of tension. Um, that's what drives it, it negative. Um, so it's a kind of tension, but it's the tension that arises due to the fact that you're keeping it at a width on the end that's bigger than it's sort of its natural width. So 
I think you can have a similar kind of interpretation, but the origin is a little different. Okay. Although cutting okay. is a little bit like you know, clamping, but it is it's certainly like, yeah, it's yeah. not really a surface tension because it doesn't couple to area, but it is a kind of tension. Yeah. Okay, okay, fine, thanks. Uh, yeah, so I'd like to uh, acknowledge all the people that worked in this. So this was the result of a collaboration between, on the theory side, my side myself and David Nelson, and uh, on the experimental side with Paul McEwen and Itai Cohen at Cornell, and then have a, a whole bunch of very good students who worked on this. Duan Duan Wang, I said, who discovered the spontaneous tilt. David Yanis did these beautiful simulations of the perforated um, membranes. My student, uh, uh, Suraj Shankar, who's now at Harvard, analyzed the elasticity of these frames. Uh, Raska Snipnik worked on uh, showing that you could reproduce the running of the bending rigidity in these coarse grained kinds of uh, models of graphene as an, as an elastic membrane. Um, my student Jital Ten, uh, Jital Chen, student here at UCSB, he has developed a full theory of this tilt transition that we're about to publish. And Suraj Babesh you know, worked on this thermalized oil of buckling, and Kao Moshe also worked on this elasticity of the frames. Did really beautiful work on that. He's a, the assistant professor at the Hebrew University of Jerusalem now. And Andre Kozmerli was a postdoc with David Nelson. And he's now in the engineering department at Princeton faculty member. And uh, I have a new, another new student here at UCSB that is working also on this tilt and the effects of nonlinearity in these systems. Uh, so thank you. Thank you, Professor Bovik, for a very, very fascinating talk. Um, are there any other questions? Uh, I just had a quick question. So, you know, the spontaneous tilt that you showed us, so yes. uh, how much it tilts depends on what? Yes, yeah, so, okay, let me go back. That was pretty fast. So here's the phase diagram. So um, the colors here show the degree of tilt. So it depends on two things. Um, mostly depends on the degree of the clamping. So that is this width W at the end that you're clamping. So that is controlled by the aspect ratio, the width divided by the length. So if I fix a temperature like uh, 0.1 here, um, then I go across, blue is no tilt, and green is moderate tilt, and red is high tilt. So because more clamping is effectively pulling it out with respect to this thermalized reference state. But it's also temperature dependent. So um, going up here is uh, lower temperature. So this is an effect where it's the disorder of thermal fluctuations that drives the ordering transition, the tilt. So it's a, like most of the physics in these systems, it's an order from disorder kind of effect. So you want to be, um, you want to be, have enough thermal fluctuations, high enough temperature that you get the effect of the effect of clamping pulling out with respect to the thermalized reference state. Yeah. So it's these two things. Okay. Thank you. Uh, I have a short question. Professor Baskaran. Yeah. Uh, so, uh, experimentally, when you talk about uh, graphene and its structural motions, electron and hole puddles are spontaneously produced. Mm. And uh, how do they affect? Are they relevant? Are they are very weak? Or they have significant contributions when you go to large length scales? Uh, yes, they, they can actually. So um, the electronics, or the um, photons or, uh, will couple to the phonons. So the electronic degrees of freedom will couple to the uh, elastic degrees of freedom. So electronic effects can, for example, um, effectively soften the system, lower the Young's modulus and vice versa. So the growth in the elastic properties or bending modulus and elastic modulus with size will feed back into the electronic behavior. Um, 
you know also there's all, all these experiments on strain engineering of graphene. So um, the, the buckled kinds of shapes of uh, these systems will affect uh, electronic properties like uh, magneto resistance and things like that. Uh, it's not quite as much explored and the, the theory is quite a bit harder, but that has been looked at, yeah. A lot can be done there. Yeah, I had a short question, the yes. tilt part. So in the pictures that you showed, um, uh, it looked like it's a, uh, I mean, there is, there is no net overall curvature for the tilted part, right? I mean, it's kind of uh, overall tilt, but no net curvature. Is that correct? Okay. So, yeah. So um, there is actually some curvature. So um, this, the, the, the strains change from the middle um, to the end. So that induces some kind of curvature. Actually, it's a kind of Euler buckling. So it's a little bit curved, like the effect can be understood as sort of half of Euler buckling. So it's curved over a little bit uh, at the ends, but it's a basically overall fairly flat thing. Yeah, that's why you can describe it basically by you know the tangent of this angle, but there is some structure there, yeah. Okay, thanks, Ian. Are there any other questions? If there are no other questions, uh, let's thank uh, Professor Bovig virtually uh, for a very interesting talk. Thank you so much. Thank you, my pleasure. Thanks for having me. Yeah. Okay. See, see you all, right. and yes. be safe and take care, everybody. See some friends, yeah. Okay. Okay. Bye. Bye. Have a good day. You too. Thank you.